This is ADT 2150U, Digital Technologies and Advanced Teaching Methods. The title for this particular video clip is Constructivist Pedagogy. Over the years, the word constructivism has come to encompass many flavors of the theory it refers to, namely constructivism as a learning theory, constructivism as an approach to epistemic beliefs, constructivist epistemology, constructivism about how human beings come to know their world. In this video clip, we will learn about constructivist teaching. Before tackling the problem of defining constructivist teaching, we will try to understand part of the genesis of constructivist theory itself. We will see an overview of several constructivist philosophers, and we will try to extrapolate what constructivist teaching is from examining their arguments about what constructivist learning is. Here are some analysis questions for you to think about while you watch this video. The analysis questions for this particular video clip are as follows. From the knowledge you developed in the previous videos and the knowledge you will develop in this video, explain how social constructivist teaching differs from constructivist teaching. In your opinion, which philosopher has the best explanation of the concept constructivism? Justify your answer. What are the fundam fundamental ideas that we must retain from their thinking? Let's look at a few theories to give us an idea of the important concepts that underlie constructivist theory. The first one is John Dewey. Education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. John Dewey taught that education must engage the learners in authentic life experiences by offering opportunities to explore, make errors, and reflect on what they did. Dewey really taught that these opportunities should be offered to all learners no matter where they came from. The constructivist idea behind this was that rather than looking at reality as something that could be mirrored in the minds of learners, these experiences could generate constructions in the learners' minds. Learners could then become participants in this reality and help transform it depending on the social context in which their construction were embedded. Maria Montessori is another important philosopher. She wrote that education is a natural process carried out by the child and is not acquired by listening to words, but by experiences in the environment. What's interesting about her is that Maria Montessori was the first woman to receive the distinction of Doctor of Medicine in Italy. She worked with children with intellectual disabilities and spent a lot of time observing them. She started developing materials for them, which she later adapted for typical children. This was the foundation of her pedagogical method. While she worked with children with intellectual disabilities, Montessori noticed that when given the choice between playing or doing authentic tasks, they preferred doing something real. She also noticed that children were happy when they were concentrated in their tasks. She realized that children learned more when she prepared activities that were embedded in the environment in which they could concentrate. This is a method that could help transform children and grow into adults who had a clear vision of the world and their place in it. She wrote several books, which became the foundation of the Asociación Montessori Internacional. David Cobb and Roger Fry are two important philosophers as well. They created the model of experiential learning. This model has four elements, concrete experience, observation and reflection, the formation of abstract concepts, and testing in new situations. Cobb and Fry argue that learning can start at any point in the model, which is often why we refer to this model as the experiential learning cycle. Let's say that in the case of Sam, learning starts with an experience about working in a group. In the traditional view of learning, learning stops when a group hands in their assignment. However, in this model, this can be just a starting point. Indeed, learning continues when Sam starts to reflect about the experience he had. He can think about what worked and what didn't, what he liked about others and what he didn't, and about how he was perceived by others. Then Sam needs to form abstract concepts inside his mind about hand, how to handle group work the next time. 
He can also think about how he can reinvest the disciplinary content he learned through group work. And the cycle continues when Sam starts to experiment again. Another important argument is that the model should be looked at as a continuous spiral. Two aspects of the model are important, here and now experiences and the use of feedback. George Kelly was a philosopher who thought that a person's processes are psychologically channelized by the way in which he or she anticipates events. This was the fundamental postulate of the theory of personal constructs, which describes 12 statements, which includes one fundamental postulate and 11 corollaries. The theory is based on a mathematic mathematical approach from which is derived a methodology. Um, we do not have time to, do, to cover this in this video, but if you want more information on it, you can type in repgrid.com, which is indicated at the bottom of the slide, and you will get much information about it on the internet. Let's go back to the fundamental postulate. A person's processes are psychologically channelized by the way in which he anticipates events. This is the view according to which human beings are personal scientists of their own lives. According to Kelly, people have personal theories that they continuously test, revise, and expand. These personal theories are recurring themes in their lives, and he called those personal constructs. Personal constructs are used to predict what will happen, and the more the constructs are precise, the more the person can control what will happen. When predictions fail, the person must review his or her personal constructs. Kelly used the metaphor of man the scientist to explain how people experiment in their lives in order to anticipate events. This theory is also called constructive alternativism because the underlying idea is that how we see the world is always subject to revision because our beliefs are not concrete truths but act as construing events tentatively. Ernst von Glassesfeld was the father of radical constructivism. What is radical constructivism? It is an unconventional approach to the problems of knowledge and knowing. It starts from the assumption that no matter how it be defined, it is in the heads of persons, and that the thinking subject has no alternative but to construct what he or she knows on the basis of his or her own experience. You might remember that in connective knowledge, we had differing arguments. In a nutshell, constructivism is a theory of active knowing. It does not consider that the knowledge reflects the world. Instead, it depends on how the knower constructs the world. The two basic principles of radical constructivism are as follows. The first one is that knowledge is not passively received either through the senses or by way of communication, but it is actively built up by the cognizant subject. The second basic principle is that the function of cognition is adaptive and serves the subject organization of the experiential world, not the discovery of an objective ontological reality. For example, a chair is not just a chair that we can feel. It is an object that becomes a concept in the mind of the knower. As we come to recognize various types of objects, we can determine that the concept of chair is larger than just a traditional chair, like the one that we see here. It can have different shapes. Actually, the one that we're looking at is not really a chair when we think about it. It looks like a chair. If we were not able to actively organize concept in our personal way of construing reality, we couldn't think that this chair actually, which we think represents a regular chair, is not really a chair. It could be a sculpture on which we should not sit, or again, it could be a two-dimensional object that is drawn on a piece of paper and it does not represent a chair whatsoever. The synthesis questions for this video clip are as follows. What are the commonalities between the ideas of these theorists? What would constructivist teaching look like if you took all these ideas and weaved them together to form a teaching method? And finally, 
what types of experiences or interactions should learners go through in a constructivist teaching program? 